Hi, all right. So I'm gonna talk about controversies in obstetric anesthesia. I have no disclosures. Um, and when this topic was um, given to me, I was quite excited about it, but I realized it's a lofty topic. Um, and I elicited um, help from many of my colleagues out in the community about what the, they thought were controversies um, and realized that the list was getting quite long. So I picked three um, that I could cover in 30 minutes. This could actually be a whole section. Um, so let's, let's start talking about the first um, one that is quite interesting and has taken on a new um, realm in the obstetric and, and midwife group, the oral intake and labor. So there's the obstetric pr perspective, which I'll present to you, the midwife perspective, and then we'll talk a little bit about our anesthesia perspective. So th this commonly happens to me where I'm called into the labor room um, and asked um, to place an epidural, um, but the patient wants to have it placed after she has something to eat. And when I walk in the room, I see a large amount of food, and I'm always <laughs> disheartened. <laughs> so um, where is this coming from? Well, uh, there was a clinical opinion published recently, and, and it, the senior author was uh, Dr. Sabai, and actually interesting, Dr. Sperling, who's one of our maternal fetal medicine fellows, um, just a first year this year, um, presented this. He um, interestingly said he thought about this topic after he was interviewing at UCSF and was able to come to the Saul Schneider. So I'm a little concerned what we said there that made him uh, decide that we, he should present this um, new idea of, of loosening oral intake restrictions. And the idea is that in low-risk laboring women, maybe we should allow them to eat and drink. And you know, they presented the recommendations from a large group of various um, uh, uh, international groups of College of Midwives. We have, you know, ACOG. We have the World Health Organization. And you can see there. There's lots of differing, varying um, ideas. I think the midwives have this self-determination. We World Health says no non-interference for the desire for food and and liquid intake without reason. So, um, as you go through these, they presented, you know, maybe we should be considering um, in the U.S. loosening up our guidelines. And one of the things that gets mentioned over and over again is the idea that since we're using um, epidural analgesia and um, we're do, do, doing less and less general anesthetic, that maybe we should um, consider allowing patients to eat um, and drink while they're in labor. Now, this is um, the table of the proposed um, individuals. They didn't go you know, too far out there. They were saying, look, we're, we're going to be reasonable. These are the individuals that we probably shouldn't allow um, a big um, meal and burger and fries in labor. And you can see a lot of those really make sense. Um, I, I find that once you start whittling down all of those at our institution, there's probably not that many people that we would be able to give a burger and fries if we were willing to, to take this risk. When you look at the um, midwife um, groups, they made a statement that, again, it's about self-determination, um, and they also point out the use of epidural analgesia for interpartum pain is, um, should not preclude oral intake. And this comes up over and over again. So I wanted to um, go back in the literature, and sorry, this got cut off, but um, this was a paper actually from, we're going back in time to 1992. Um, I kind of feel like we're going back in time right now in, in this country, so it's kind of fitting. But we're, um, <laughs> we're, uh, we did a, an RCT where they looked at fentanyl and epidurals looking at delayed gastric emptying. And what they did is they looked at bupivacaine and they looked at the treatment group, which is bupivacaine and fentanyl, and the fentanyl was 100 mics. And what they found in, was delayed gastric emptying in the fentanyl group. Now they were using 0.375%. I mean, that's you know, not what we do now. So you know, fast forward, and now we're getting into 1997. We're moving up in time. And this group actually said, well, let's look at kind of these lower concentrations, something that we are now you know, starting to use in modern obstetrics. And um, they were using 0.125 and 0.0625 with fentanyl. And they actually did something interesting where they looked at different infusion rates. Um, so really at um, 30 cc's of uh, one, one group, and then the B group was 40 to 50. Now that really translates into getting um, up to, in the, the larger, the 40 to 55 cc's, um, 
over in four and a half hours, you get greater than 100 mics of um, fentanyl. And in that group, they did see, um, again, delayed gastric emptying. So when looking at this, it's not uh, the epidural is, means that we can use, um, be liberal with our food intake. I mean, there is an effect of delayed gastric emptying if you're using fentanyl. And now let's look at modern obstetrics. We use low concentrations, we add fentanyl, we're doing programmed intermittent boluses at a lot of institutions. So really, should we maybe now think we, we could give our patients some food? So Dr. Vallejo looked at this and thought, well, we're not gonna go and give patients you know, burger and fries, but what if we give them a high protein drink in labor? And we could compare that to what many of us um, do, which is ice chips and clears. And so they studied this looking both at various outcomes, um, nausea and vomiting, patient satisfaction, and he, um, and of course I would expect this from Dr. Vallejo, ultrasounded to look at gastric emptying. So what they did was um, they did um, these two different um, groups where they had 0.08 percent with 100 mics of fentanyl. Um, all those patients got that plus the infusion of two mics of fentanyl with the 0.08 percent. And then they said either you get the protein drink or you get the ice chips. And what they found was there was really no difference in gastric emptying time. There was no difference in nausea vomiting, but patients were satisfied. There was more patient satisfaction with the protein drink. So that brings us to the rebuttal from the oral intake in, uh, during labor. And this was from our own uh, Dr. Lefford at um, Mass General. She actually responded to Dr. Um, Spurloff's uh, opinion article and said, in contemporary times with limited oral intake, aspiration is still associated in 7% um, of the maternal cardiac arrest. So really maybe this is something that we need to take a step back and not get um, too excited about letting patients go and have solid foods. And again, this is what the, was put in the uh, rebuttal and they looked at um, the maternal cardiac arrest, you can see from 1998 to 2011, that's um, 4,800 patients roughly, and aspiration pneumonitis was 7% of the maternal arrest causes. So really this is not something that is um, minor and, and is of uh, non-consequence. It has a huge consequence on maternal mortality and morbidity. And so these are the current guidelines. The recommendations are for moderate clears. Again, we have the scheduled cases, two hours of clears. I think a lot of us are um, doing the um, ERAS, and I think Dr. Rollins is gonna talk about that tomorrow, what we're doing at our institution, and we are offering the protein drink before. Um, laboring patients um, have additional risk factors, um, and they should not, uh, we should restrict giving them solid foods and, and avoid it in those patients. And so really from this controversy, I would say it still is a real concern, um, aspiration, and we should take it um, seriously. And maybe we can consider a kind of midway of giving patients clear protein beverages in labor. And it's not, other than improving uh, patient satisfaction, it's not really doing anything to change their um, outcome of nausea and vomiting and the, and the um, issues that surround labor progression. So the next controversy postpartum tubal ligation, urgent or elective case. Now, this one is something near and dear to me because we will talk about maternal mortality increasing in the U.S. So you've t heard this talk, uh, probably these are gonna be um, something that we've already heard about from this morning, but this is um, becoming major health crisis. We're going in the wrong direction, and you can see as our um, the death, maternal death is now going up. It's increased 26, almost 27% in the country. In uh, the paper that analyzed this, they looked at California and Texas separately. And that's because California had less than 15 and a half deaths per 100,000, but Texas doubled to almost 36 um, deaths per 100,000. So I'm glad I'm in California, but for comparison, Germany is only four per 100,000. So we still have a way to go. And then if you look at this a little more carefully, you can start to see the differences um, between um, races and ages. And so clearly non-Hispanic blacks, as they are getting older, they're, they're taking the brunt of the maternal mortality. 
Again, in California, we're not doing much better, despite the fact that we you know, can brag about our low rates. We're still not doing any better among our African Americans. There was a group that wanted to really dig deeper into this and look at what the health disparity issues are in states specifically and really get at how can we disentangle the mortality with race. And what they found was the most obviously dramatic increases in Hispanic, non-Hispanic black women. And one of the key things that they found was unintended births. And those patients had four or less prenatal visits. And their conclusions were that you know, utilization by underserved populations is an important issue in maternal mortality. So how does this affect the sterilization? Well, when you consider ethnic and racial differences in sterilization, this group looked at this and they really found that low-income racial and ethnic minority women are less likely to undergo sterilization following delivery compared to low-income whites and privately insured women with similar parities. And so there are some barriers that are affecting these women from getting um, sterilization. And, you know, it is a process that for a woman who goes through um, counseling and prenatal care, that's always discussed over and over during their prenatal visits. And it takes a lot of paperwork and formats and things have to get signed and they have to have their paper with them. And, you know, as you know, when you go through and, and do a postpartum tubal ligation, everything has to be signed. And those are put in place for good reason because there was sterilization that was happening historically among um, people of color in the past. And so there had to be these barriers. But so these women that come into labor and delivery have decided that they definitely do not want to have continued fertility. And so a group, actually Dr. Gossett, who was at Northwestern, um, is now our new um, division chief for gynecology um, at UCSF, did a paper when she was at Northwestern looking at the request and fulfillment among patients who were high-risk pregnancies. And so I would imagine, you know, we're thinking in these patients that are high-risk, that have gone through all this extensive counseling, who have decided that they themselves do not want to risk another pregnancy for their um, you know, obviously their health, they would be very motivated, motivated to have this um, tubal ligation. And so they figured of all of the barriers that we have to fulfilling these requests, because it's about 50% of the women that want a tubal ligation actually fulfill it by the time they're discharged. They thought those patients would probably get more of fulfillment. And they found that no, although they requested it more often, they decided this pregnancy was risky enough, they weren't going to undergo it. They actually didn't get it fulfilled any more frequently than those patients that were low risk. And um, as a matter of fact, those patients that had unfulfilled risks that went home not having the tubal ligation, 15% of them ended up coming back with subsequent pregnancies. And so when we talk about um, what we can do um, when we think, you know, we're going to discharge this patient, we couldn't get her her tubal ligation, you know, she can use some long-acting reversible contraceptive and maybe she could have an interval tubal. This, this study showed that's just not happening. So they're there, they've been counseled, you know, how can they, how can, how can we fulfill this for them? And the committee opinion in ACOG said only 50% of the women who undergo counseling um, actually have the tubal ligation. And when we talk about, I know Dr. Sullivan talked about what we can do with um, how we can make an impact on cesarean rates, we can actually make an impact in maternal mortality by trying to staff these cases as urgent cases. In the same way that we would never make a patient wait um, too long for a urgent C-section, we shouldn't be making these patients wait for a tubal ligation because it is um, an urgent procedure. And so um, on the tubal ligation conclusion, we'll say this is definitely something that we can have an impact in, in maternal mortality and particularly in women that would be most impact, that most impact we would see would be from these women who have the higher mortality rates. And so I think ACOG supports that and when we think about staffing that, that's one of our priorities as we get those patients in and whatever we can do to utilize that staffing to get the tubal ligation fulfilled, we, we do it. Now, moving on to another fun topic, which is management of inherent placental disease. We heard a little bit about that um, before lunch. Um, again, this is um, a, one of the things that we talked about, C-sections increasing, and this is the, the result of that. We're seeing more um, placental 
adherent placental disease or placenta accretas, procretas, and cretas. And you can see this, this is something that's very common in those women who have uh, risk of placenta accreta with placenta previa, the number of deliveries increase, so does their risk of having a placenta accreta. And so how do we um, diagnose this? It's, it's really challenging. Um, we've gotten much better, and I um, utilize our um, radiology colleagues to help. They um, have been looking at both the ultrasound and MRI. Those, there's been lots of studies about it. It's both increasing um, ultrasound and MRI. And what we found that with MRI, it's really helpful for surgical planning. Ultrasound is still considered the first line for diagnosis. And then interestingly, we've been using um, at, at our institution serial ultrasounds um, for these high-risk patients that we've already identified as you know, highly likely to have an accreta. And and we use it for um, monitoring. I'm going to show you pictures. This is a uh, picture from our um, ultrasonographers. And this is a patient who, um, let's see, we don't have a pointer, but if you look at the 24 week um, ultrasound, the red actually is normal myometrium. The placenta is completely surrounding that. Now, fast forward to 28 weeks those two arrows in between those arrows is now where you see the placenta completely bulging out um, into the area um, and obliterating much of the myometrium on that side. Now at 34 weeks, and we usually tend to do these deliveries between 34 to uh, 35 weeks because we're trying to prevent any emergent delivery and we want it controlled with all members of our team there. Um, one of the things that we've started to employ is uh, intraoperative ultrasound. And so this um, two images that you can see are at 34 weeks in the OR, um, the ultrasonographer comes in and is basically scanning the um, part where the arrow is, you can see that darkness, that's, um, they're pointing to the placenta, that's the fetal head actually there, and then you can see the placenta where the tip of the arrow is, and as it goes across, they've outlined the placenta you can see in, in red there. You can see that um, the uterine serosa is really almost non-existent. I mean, I think the PATH report says they're within 0.1 centimeters of the uterine serosa. So we utilize this at our institution to decide where we're going to go for the incision and delivery of the fetus. And many of these cases we know are already going to have a cesarean hysterectomy. So where we um, place our incision to deliver the, the fetus is not really an issue as far as future deliveries. There won't be but they, um, we can minimize the blood loss while we're delivering the fetus. And so that's um, how we're, we're utilizing ultrasound. And so I look at this um, as an idea of managing these patients as a really multidisciplinary approach. We've developed a team, a MAPS team, which is a, we call it the Multidisciplinary Adherent Placental Service. And we've employed every uh, individual that you can see there from all the different specialties to manage these patients. And um, many of community practices that I've talked to have something similar to this. Um, and those that do this have found great success. What we do, um, and what I encourage everyone to do that do these deliveries, is to have the team meetings, reviewing serial imaging and surgical planning, and every member um, from those teams are there to discuss cases. We decide the location of the procedure, whether it's going to be um, the, LD, uh, the labor and delivery or whether it needs to go downstairs, who we need. Um, we don't need to have a vascular surgeon for everyone, but there are some that we would maybe put them on alert to be available. And then we have a discussion about whether we're doing an elective CHIST um, versus a cesarean delivery with a possible CHIST. And we kind of break that down to, are you going to pull or are you not going to pull? And so we always ask our OB colleagues, if they're going to pull, we're you know, prepared that it can be a lot more bloodier while they're trying to decide if it's actually adherent or not. We also need to have readiness um, for an urgent or emergent procedure. And that really comes down to, for us, um, also the patient's proximity to the hospital. So many of these patients that are referred to us are referred from outside um, community hospitals. And um, they are concerned that you know, this patient lives far away. We will oftentimes if, um, admit them and, and follow them closely until the time is that they, they need to be delivered. And sometimes that means delivering them earlier if they're starting to contract. 
For us, the anesthesia considerations, um, it's interesting to see um, the variation in practices. I don't think there's any real solid evidence that one technique is better um, for outcomes. I think people employ lots of different, whether it's neural axial alone, general anesthesia, or a combination. Um, I had um, discussed with one of our um, current faculty, he trained at the Brigham for his fellowship, and he presented um, an abstract that is now getting prepared for publication where they did um, I think it was 76% of uh, the patients that had sus a suspected accreta um, and actually did of the 121 patients. And of those patients, 88% had neuroaxial. And their conversion to general anesthesia was only 13%. I'm not surprised because I know that the Brigham loves to do lots of neuroaxial techniques, but if you um, compare that to other institutions and other surveys, you'll find out that that just varies by institution, and I have uh, some, some data to show you. Um, in addition to sort of deciding your technique, it's not usually a one-size-fits-all for every patient, and it's hard for us to really develop algorithms because each case is different, and that's why it's important to have these team meetings. We employ cell saver, invasive of monitoring um, and obviously large bore IV and, and sometimes central venous access depending on what it looks like on the imaging. Um, so the Israeli survey uh, looked at um, 26 Israeli hospitals. I, I know Dr. Butwick was part of the authors on this. I am impressed that you guys got a 100% response rate. So I don't know what, how you did that, but 100% um, of the people surveyed said, um, responded to it. And, and really, you can see there, there's a different view of how they would do. If they're highly suspicious, 96% would, would do general anesthesia. And uh, you can see 69, 70% for low suspicion. So what do they do in low resource areas? So speaking of you know, morbidity and mortality, you know, looking at what we have here at you know, institutions um, it, like UCSF or Stanford or Brigham and Northwestern, all of those you know, high level places where they get referral in from, with lots of you know, specialists, what do you do if you are in uh, Bogota, Colombia? So this um, group actually I thought was quite interesting that they did a case series looking at 39 identified cases. They were all retrospective, so they confirmed um, with um, pathology. Of course, CHIS were performed in all cases. There was no question of whether we were going to pull and see if it really was. They just went straight to this, the CHIS. And 34 patients had neuroaxial with 15 conversion to general, which is, you know, not, not bad. Um, they had an EBL of 2,000 and no deaths. One of the things that they highlighted, which again I'm, I'm going to say is that this multidisciplinary approach was really valuable. And they needed to have gynecologic surgeons that are comfortable doing these procedures in addition to the obstetric team and the anesthesiologists. So, what, um, if you looked at the list that I had, you noticed that interventional radiology was on that list. And when we think about interventional radiology, oftentimes people talk about um, balloon catheters for these patients. And so uh, a lot has been made of you know, what to do with balloon catheters, and you guys heard about it earlier. Um, there was an RCT um, looking at the um, prenatally diagnosed accretas, and they did a, um, a control versus preoperative balloon catheters. They placed them in the anterior division of the iliac artery. And they were looking at primary outcomes. The primary outcomes, they were looking at packed red blood cells. There was other secondary outcomes, um, obviously uh, blood loss. Um, they looked at neonatal outcomes, um, you know, various host of things, and found that there was really no difference on either primary or secondary outcomes for uh, those that were receiving the perioperative balloon catheters. They did find um, two complications with them in this trial. One was buttock uh, claudication and then leg pain and weakness in two patients. Um, I think that if you would ask our interventional radiologists, they um, are not too excited about doing the balloon catheters and would rather prefer to do embolization somewhat um, after the, the delivery um, and after uh, the hysterectomy if, if necessary. Um, they are much more aggressive with their, um, their embolization than other institutions. And so when we talk about what their role is, um, it's still, I think, up in the air. And I think that's one of the things that we are interested in looking at at UCSF with our interventional radiology colleagues is where do they come into play and how do we utilize them? 
Here's a case that um, really highlights um, how we utilize them in these situations. This is a picture of an embolization of a patient who um, had a pretty significant um, invasive placenta that abutted the iliac vein. Um, I think the patient had something on the order of uh, 30 liters of blood loss, and we had vascular surgery there helping with um, the repair of the iliac vein. She still bled considerable amount, and despite the fact that they got control of it, we still knew that we needed the interventional radiologist to come in and help us um, with embolization. And when they went in and did their um, in geography, they saw that there was bleeding from small branches of the internal iliac artery. So you can see right there um, when they've the nice little circle that the radiologist uh, put in. They went ahead, and again, you can see what this they call extravasation here, and they um, gel foamed. And so this is a picture of the gel foam after the gel foam placed, and they did the anterior division. Um, and when they when they put that gel foam, and you see complete stop. They actually um, also say that they, they tend not to do the posterior division, so they won't completely embolize the entire area because they want to prevent any um, buttock necrosis. And so this actually, um, the patient went from the OR um, after it was stabilized with the um, vascular surgeons. We were still transfusing and needed to go into IR. Once um, she went to interventional radiology, she was stable and went to the unit with no further need for transfusion. So I think that this highlights their um, ability to help um, with these very complex patients. So we're going to see more of these. Um, we uh, already have seen our numbers increase over the last um, couple years in managing these adherent placental disease patients. We do um, opt for this multidisciplinary approach. There's lots of um, you know, work to be done and research to be done in, in this area and figuring out what's the best management. I think um, how uh, we manage it anesthetically from whether it's neural axial, general, or combination really depends on what the surgical plan is, um, discussion with our team and what they need. And we definitely know that for us, interventional radiology has a, a pretty significant role in the management of many of these patients. For us, we don't use the um, balloon catheters, but they come into play for embolization afterwards. So. With that, um, I'm going to just leave you with our Women's March. We're a very controversial uh, institution, and, and I think the San Francisco is uh, heaped in controversy. This was the Women's March in San Francisco at the Civic Center. That little picture in there is our um, OBGYN residents and I that were marching. So thanks. <laughs>